an opportunity to learn about two amazing professionals that we have here in our community. Um, tonight, I'm going to play the role of interviewer, so my goal is just to ask some fun questions and learn a little bit more about um, Lieutenant Silza and Dr. Chatterjee. Um, one of the things that we wanted to do tonight, because these are newer roles to our community, is give these professionals an opportunity to reflect on what they've been doing for the last um, six to nine months, and also um, go over some pre-submitted questions that we got in advance of tonight's event. Uh, following their presentations, you'll have an opportunity for a written reflection, and you're welcome to talk with our guests one-on-one -on -one after the presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to be here tonight. There's so many things going on in Reading, all amazing things, but thank you for choosing to be here with us. I want to thank RCTV for recording tonight's presentation. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I just want to remind you that we will not be taking questions during the actual presentation. We have 12 questions that we're going to review, and after we finish those up, you'll be able to come up and ask questions one-on-one. -on -one. Our guests are both accomplished professionals in their fields. Your handouts show their biographies. You'll see that Lieutenant Silva is a long-standing police officer with our department, is also an educator. We're going to hear more about his background. Dr. Shatterjee comes to us with a wealth of academic ex expertise as well as experience in, in the nonprofit and for profit sectors. I encourage you to read through their information. Tonight's agenda is also on the back of that handout. And then we have another handout that is frequently asked questions. What are some of the key questions that get asked about the civil rights officer and the director of equity and inclusion? So let's get into the questions. So I'm going to ask you both um, to take a minute to talk about your respective roles. So Desha, would you like to go first? Absolutely. Can everybody hear me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Very glad to be here and for this opportunity. Um, the newly established Office of Equity and Social Justice um, is a shared town-wide educational resource based out of the Reading Public Library. I am the first inaugural director for that office, and I'm in charge of providing support to town residents, employees, our leaders, and staff on matters pertaining to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I do that in four primary ways. Um, I spearhead or help provide supplemental support to other staff in terms of uh, for community events and educational programs. I also work as an intern consultant for our department heads and program directors aiding um, in matters related to staff training, uh, diversity practices in hiring, on process review, etc. I also spend time connecting people to resources and to other people in and around town. And one of the ways in which I do that, and a lot of us are involved in that, is uh, my advisory board, partners and allies for inclusive training. And lastly, I network with peer municipalities in Massachusetts to document best practices in the field of diversity and equity inclusion so that it rests in my office as a reference point when and if there is a need uh, to kind of draw on that information. Thank you, Sebastian. Pat, can you talk a little bit about your role as a civil rights officer and your lieutenant with the Reading Police Department? Sure, so uh, this past January, uh, the Reading Police Department uh, put, into this, uh, put into fruition this new position called the civil rights officer. Uh, partially it was uh, mandated by the uh, Post, which is the Peace Officer Standards and Training Commission that was established last year um, uh, through some, some law changes in Massachusetts. Uh, we've always had a civil rights designated civil rights officer, but all they did was simply submit um, data uh, to, the, to the government uh, every year. Uh, Chief Clark took that initiative to make this a full time role, not just a designated person who submitted data, but somebody who actually did this kind of full time and, and took it on uh, completely as a, as a new role in the police department. Thought so much of it that he also made it a supervisory position. So as a sergeant last last January, I took that role on. Um, it coincided really nicely with Sedition starting in town as well. So we had two new roles that complemented one another. Uh, and since January, I've been doing my best to meet all the important stakeholders in town. Uh, I've been an active member of PAIR since its first days, and I'll transition HRAC into into PAIR, um, as well as meeting all the building principals, uh, you know, community leaders, uh, people that are interested in. in you know, equity, social justice, and really just treating each other fairly and, and, and like human beings. And so as the civil rights officer, I kind of have a, a two-headed role. The first is to uh, investigate and, and assist in prosecution of any hate crimes that happen in Reading. Fortunately, I don't get used very much uh, in that role, which is really great. Um, in the town of Reading, to have that be a problem for the civil rights officer, not have enough work in that portion of my job. 
Uh, so I get to spend essentially all of my time in the other aspect of it, which is really a community function. So working with Sadeshna, uh, working with really anybody in town that, that needs to, that needs a civil rights officer to be a part of it, really just be a member of the community, to take on things like hate-based incidents, something that doesn't qualify as a crime, but nonetheless affects our community very greatly, so we handle it as a community, not as a criminal justice matter, but as a community matter. So that's really what I've been doing since January. Trying to establish this position was great, is you know, I've been able to continue that through and, and keep developing it in the way I think it should be, with uh, obviously help from suggestion and community uh, partnerships as well. Great. So in learning um, and working with both of you, I was really impressed with the commitment that you both had to education as part of your professional development. So I was wondering if you could share your educational backgrounds and why you chose to pursue advanced degrees and a little bit more about what education and training means to you. Sure. Um, I was always a very nerdy kid. I was stuck with my history books and my social science books mostly, and I somewhere I always knew that I wanted to pursue an advanced degree in the area. Um, and that's what brought me to the United States. I'm an immigrant. I was born and raised in India, and I came here about 89 years ago to pursue my doctorate degree. I got my PhD from UMass Boston. And for prior to stepping into this role, I spent many years in higher education in, with academic research and teaching. My specialization was particularly in the area of human rights, gender and racial equity and inclusion, and um, just building inclusive uh, governments and society and so on and so forth. Um, grad school is really like, it's a terrific experience and it equips you with a lot of skills, but two of the skills that I think I actively kind of engage with and use on a daily basis in this current role is non-binary thinking, by which I mean kind of acknowledging um, that multiple truths often do coexist. There's no one truth and false. No zero to one kind of binary coding. And what that means for DEI work is that um, kind of acknowledging multiple experiences, multiple stories from people. And the second bit is um, data interpretation. Of course, data is you know, everything, numbers are important. It's a necessary starting point, but it's not sufficient by itself. So kind of critically thinking through data, looking at what data we have, what data we don't have, and critically analyzing how we got there uh, are some important skills that I picked up from grad school and my practice on a daily basis. Okay. Uh, sure, so uh, I'm a graduate of Reading High School. Now I look this nice one, the old one. <laughs> um, and if you had told me at my graduation from high school that I was gonna spend another 10 years learning, I would said you were crazy. And if you said after that 10 years, not only are you going to finish learning, but then you're going to go back and be a teacher as well, I probably would have really thought you were crazy. So I went to Salem State, got my undergraduate degree from there, went to UMass Lowell, got my master's degree from there, both in criminal justice. Uh, I'm currently an adjunct professor of criminology at uh, Merrimack College. Um, and starting in January, I'll be part of their cooperative program where their students go to the police academy during the day and get a master's degree at night. And I'll be that professor at during the night classes to help them through that program. Um, training and education is everything in law enforcement. Um, to think that the law and society is stagnant is, is crazy. So as the world changes, as the law changes, police officers need to have uh, continuous uh, training, either advanced training or, or uh, retraining, how the laws have changed even in, in a given calendar year. Um, there is a, absolutely a standard in Massachusetts and in, in the United States on how police officers should be trained. The Reading Police Department smashes through that barrier and doubles it and triples it in, in most cases. Uh, Chief Clark has taken a really strong uh, stance on not training to the minimum standard, but training to a high, higher standard, and in most cases, the highest standard of the towns around us. Um, in order to do that, he's taken a strong commitment in having a lot of our police officers become advanced instructors, myself included in that so that we can be the people teaching our own and uh, instructing our own officers, which is a really powerful thing to be able to do your own training within your own department uh, and officers learning from, from their coworkers and sometimes even their subordinates, um, some advanced training and things like that. So uh, anything we can do at the police department, anything I can do as an individual to keep learning and keep adapting to things that are changing is, is my point, excuse me, my point of view, the most paramount thing that we can do at the police department and as individual officers. Another question that was submitted uh, in advance of tonight's event, I, I think it's a great one, especially uh, because the fields that you both work in are, are very complex. 
And the question is, why do you do the work that you do? What resonates for you? So again, as far as I can remember, I think I've always been a very mission driven person. I grew up um, and I was educated in a Catholic educational institution for the first 18 years of my life. Um, and I have a huge Indian family. And I think what comes from both of those combined experiences is that kind of community service, giving back to the community, to people around you, was always a very integral value that was a part of my upbringing. Um, doing the DEI role is not unique in a municipal setting. A lot of different kind of organizations have a diversity and inclusion positions. What resonates with me with this particular role and doing it in a town setting is the people aspect of it. I love working with people. I'm a very social person. I love the community outreach and of the job. And definitely kind of the chance to um, work not just for the community, but with the community and learn with, along with other community members like that here. I think that's, that's a very enriching part of my job that I appreciate. Pat, what is it for you that resonates? Why do you do what you do? Uh, so I, I love being a police officer. Uh, I love being the person in my community that people look to when they need help or guidance or things like that. Um, as I've gone through my career and was fortunate enough to get promoted to sergeant and now, and now to lieutenant, um, I love that I've been you know, entrusted with the ability to guide sergeants and, and officers um, throughout their career and help shape their um, kind of development as well. Uh, as a civil rights officer, I love that I can be the catalyst and the liaison between our police department and the community to really show the community that our officers care about everybody in this community and care that everybody in this community feels safe and, and heard and trusted to go about their daily lives happily and, and without you know, interference from anybody. And I take, I will take great pride if somebody stops that or tries to stop that and being the person that's going to stop them from stopping that. I haven't had to do it legally yet, like I said, going pretty good so far in Reading as far as criminal aspects, um, which is, uh, uh, I think, a badge of honor for the town of Reading to have a position, full-time position, waiting for anything to happen that hasn't happened yet, hasn't been reported for the police yet. So uh, that's what I love about it. I love being that person. I love that I'm up on stage here, not for any, any personal reason or anything like that. I just like being the liaison. I like being the person that others can look to uh, for help or assistance. And I like uh, the, the area that I'm starting to develop this expertise in. Really important one, and one that um, can be overlooked in law enforcement. So I don't think it should be. And I think the police department, the right police department, is taking a really strong um, tra track on that to push things in the right direction. So, a related question came in. Um, people have learned that you've been promoted from sergeant to lieutenant, and they're curious about how your new duties will still enable you to, enable you to fulfill your existing duties as civil rights officer. Yep, so um, I'd be 100% lying to everybody in this room and whoever watches on TV to tell you that I'm not going to have a full plate. Um, my new position um, is that I am, the, uh, I am the division commander of the entire day patrol division. So I oversee a whole lot of police officers. Um, and that also comes with some additional administrative work. Um, the way that it's going to work is that I, I care enough about this position that I'm not going to let it falter. I like being able to continue to push this uh, position forward. I love that it wasn't handed off to somebody else, kind of it, I, what I think is kind of the most crucial time, 10 months in, where it could fizzle out and the person could miss some meetings and stop going to events like this, or I can continue it and push it forward and start planning events like this as opposed to just being somebody sitting in the audience. So while I certainly have a full plate, I have uh, every uh, intention on keeping myself open um, for all of the community events that I've already been fortunate enough to be a part of, and hopefully new ones that I'm going to learn about and get invited to in the future. So we had a couple questions for Lieutenant Silva, and I think these are great questions in terms of if someone sees something or hears something, how do they handle it in the community? And the question is, what should a civilian do um, if they've witnessed harassment, discrimination, or what they think might be a hate incident or even a hate crime? Sure, so I'll, I'll never um, substitute 911. If there's an ongoing incident where somebody's in danger, you call 911. Sometimes I'm not working, sometimes I don't answer my phone or answer my email right away, Sometimes text the tips and 1-800 numbers don't do the trick. So there's no uh, uh, substitution for 911 if there's an ongoing dangerous situation. So that's, get that one out of the way. Uh, you can always call our business line and make a report, whether I'm at work or not. Anything that has anything to do with a hate-based incident, a hate crime, any kind of bias-based incident, it's gonna find its way to my desk, my voicemail, my email, no matter how you report it. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. 
if this is more something that you're, you're thinking about, something you just want to sit down and talk about, you're more than welcome to reach out to any of the 14 different ways that are listed on that flyer about how to get in contact with me. Um, I'm more than happy to set up a meeting or, or answer any questions that you may, may have. If you want to take it even one step further and say, well, I do want to learn some stuff, I do want to report something, but I don't want my name involved in anything, we have two essentially anonymous ways that are listed on those handouts. The first is the Reading Police Department's text a tip, which is 100% anonymous. You can text a tip right in. If you use any of those kind of buzzwords like bias or hate crime or hate based incident, it, it'll get quickly forwarded to me so that um, both because the other officer probably doesn't want to handle it and because they know that I have the ability to, to handle it myself. Uh, and then I've also included the, the 1 800 number uh, from uh, US Attorney Rollins' office. 1 800 N, excuse me, 188 N8 now is what it is. So it's another way to report something if you don't want to report it directly to the police, uh, right to the police department, you don't have to. You can go right to the uh, US Attorney's office. I can tell you that it could be referred back to me as well, depending on what, what the, uh, the nature of the report is. Uh, but any of those ways um, is a great way to let us know that something's happening. The only thing I'll kind of add on to that is we have to know what's happening in order to help about. So if nothing is reported to us, we don't know about it, we can't help. So please share anything that you feel like we can help you with. If I'm not the person that can help you, I'm going to help you get to the person that can. So, but we can't do it unless we know about it. So, so please reach out. And it is okay for people to call and ask questions before they report something? Absolutely. It's, it, it's, I don't want to substitute emergency situations. Sometimes, sometimes community members can not confuse those two, but substitute them. If there's an emergency situation, I want you to call, and all the police officers are well equipped to handle emergency situations, and then I can help with a follow up or something like that after. If it's something not so emergent, I'm more than happy to be, uh, to be contacted in, in any of the ways um, that we've uh, we provided to you tonight. The next question is for you both. It asks what trainings have been done related to civil rights and diversity, equity, inclusion, and access so far? So one of the first things I did when I stepped into my role, and this was way back in June, is that we did a staff training for the staff of, of the Reading Public Library uh, around cross-cultural communication and dialogue. And it sounds really specific, but I think one of the best things about that training was that we walked away feeling we could apply it to any everyday life, right? Even if you're communicating with friends, family, or communicating across departments. Uh, I brought some of that um, to pair, and we kind of all of us worked together in pair to develop uh, something that we call compass, compass guidelines, which is basically behavioral guidelines about how we, you know, swear to conduct ourselves in that room and work together. Um, that said, I'm, I'm going to be doing a training for the school district next week, um, and also in conversations with community partners like the U UUCR to do some trainings around allyship and diversity and inclusion. Um, that said, a part of my job is to, like I said, gather information about best practices, and so oftentimes I will send out emails to our town manager, other department heads, school leadership about what, you know, recommending what trainings could be helpful uh, for their respective departments. Um, I just want to take a step back and acknowledge this question about training. Um, I am a little skeptical, personally, of doing trainings as a way to kind of mark boxes. I think for DEI training to be actually effective, it needs to be a thoughtful process. It needs to entail understanding what the need is, what the context is. There's no universal kind of uh, fits all model. There's also need to kind of understand how that training will synergize with the department or the organization's um, strategic priorities. And then an additional but a very important component of self-reflection and self-learning on the part of not just staff but mostly leadership to kind of think about what values they hold dear and what is the direction towards which they want the organization or the town. Uh, or the department. And so while training is fun, it's great, um, but it needs to be part of like a larger system involving data collection, needs assessment, and strategic planning process. I know you're involved in a lot of training. <laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about this area? Uh, sure. So uh, police department is constantly training, but in, in this specific area is kind of the civil rights and diversity and equity and things like that. Um, we do, uh, everybody in the department does an annual bias-based profile um, uh, training. Uh, we also, this past year, in 2022, we were able to take part in a, like a four-part webinar, essentially, um, kind of post-effects of COVID, uh, training on, on fair, equitable, and objective policing for, for police officers. 
uh, that was um, organized and put out by some law enforcement officials, uh, some attorneys in the, in the civil rights uh, division field, um, as well as uh, supported by the ADL as well, and putting out some guidance for officers in some areas that, quite frankly, we don't have a lot of, we haven't had a lot of training in the past, and so for some of our veteran officers, this was really putting the, the, the building blocks of, of, of a, an actual name to a fair, equitable, and, and type of training for police officers. Um, it, it's also important that, to note that we go to training every single year, we have annual and service training, and the, uh, the MPTC, the, the body that governs police training in Massachusetts, has taken a really strong stance on at least one of those days being about de-escalation, or bias-based, or uh, policing, or um, profiling, or uh, civil rights, or uh, hate crimes, or something like that, um, to round out a really kind of important week, five days of, of training for the officers every single year. Um, about half of the Reading Police Department are currently certified uh, individuals for uh, crisis intervention, which is a very intensive course that's uh, given to both law enforcement officials and, and civilians as well. Um, we work with um, members from the mental health field, um, mental health clinicians, um, crisis intervention um, specialists, and things like that. Uh, it's all about working with people who are either in crisis or uh, are, are members of our community who are at a high risk of, of being victimized in some way. And the best way that we can both uh, try and prevent that, but then also respond when something does in fact happen to somebody in our community that, that kind of fits that, that category. Um, and most recently and currently, we are, uh, we're, I'm working right now with Deputy Chief Kevin to uh, set up a uh, training with a specialized officer from, from the South Shore um, on the training for our officers on the LGBTQ community. Um, something that we, uh, to my knowledge, have definitely never had a specific training on that um, for the Reading Police Department. Uh, something that is becoming uh, an everyday occurrence for us at the Reading Police Department and something that I think we need to, uh, I wouldn't say improve on, but just need to give a better basis of training for our officers so that they know the correct way to handle situations, they're able to um, better be uh, better at being inclusive and uh, do a really good job of making all of our community members, especially anybody in that community, feel as though they're, they're a part of our community and that we'll do anything we can to help them just like anybody else um, in the same regard. So the next question is um, looking to help you both. And the question is, how can the public support your work either through volunteering or donations? Um, donations are very welcome. Um, that's all I have to say about that. Um, more than donation, something that I personally really value is volunteers. I don't have staff, I'm very fully spread out, and a lot of the community reaching work that I already do is very volunteer intensive. Also, another way in which you can help out um, is come either join pair, attend a couple of sessions. Uh, it's fun, it's educative, it's informational. Uh, if there is a specific need that you have, we're happy to you know, help you address it, or at least I promise to get you the person who can help you. So these are, you know, just in terms of volunteer timing, and it doesn't need to be like an extensive commitment that you have to make. It's totally okay if you just want to come one time, or if you want to volunteer for like an hour during an event, that's totally cool. That said, uh, I'm going to throw this open. We are planning our Martin Luther King Day celebration in person for the year 2023. And it will involve a number of different kind of volunteering opportunities. Some of it will be around this auditorium when there is a cultural program, some of it will be helping out uh, Reading Harris Initiative around um, MLK Day of Service. So just letting you know if there is anything that you want to get involved in, please feel free to reach out. How about for you, how can people support your work? Yeah, so uh, for, for me it's really simple. I, I think I've already said it probably twice tonight and I'll probably say it twice more. I, I just need to be informed and I need to be included. Um, and I know that, that sounds like the opposite of what I'm probably talking about up here, but uh, if I don't know about a problem, I can't help address it. If I'm not invited to an event, I can't be there to network and talk to people and things like that. Um, I've met you know, so many great people just through PAIR, just through some of the events that PAIR has either sponsored or been a part of, um, and as well as the police department events as well, like Coffee with the Cop, I think I met two or three people that were surprised to hear me as civil rights officer. So that's why events like this are so important and so great. Um, and so, if you're a part of a community event, feel free to invite me. If I can make it, I'll, I'll be there, I promise. Um, uh, you know, so, but that's the thing for me, and still kind of one of the hardest things for me so far is, is just uh, including the police officer who that might come to you. So, I'm not usually the first person on the list. So, as long as I'm on the list, I can be the last one. As long as I'm on the list, that's fine. The next question is, what is your favorite 
question is for Sebastian, and, and it asks, is the Division of Equity and Social Justice in town or a library division? Yeah, interesting question. Um, and speaking of moving beyond binaries, I think the answer is both. Uh, the Reading Public Library is a part of the town. The leadership of the library are part of the town leadership, and staff is part of the town and staff. Um, that said, I'm physically and fiscally located in the Reading Public Library, though you will see me on any weekday, you'll see me transiting around town because I love meeting the people outside of my office. Um, and as I mentioned, it is a shared resource for the entire town. And that includes other departments, that includes other uh, you know, other staff as well. You don't need to be a department head to, to get in touch or to kind of use uh, resources located out of my office. Uh, that includes residents, it includes student groups, uh, basically anyone who has who has any kind of stakeholder engagement with the town of Reading. Um, and I think one of the things that I'm still very relatively pretty new compared to the two of you to Reading, but I think one of the things that in my experience I have observed that works well is a shared service model, like whatever you do it with the coalition. And I think that is something that we want to galvanize um, and kind of run with. So think about it as you know the way you would reserve a space in the library or borrow equipment or borrow books. You could borrow the Office of Equity and Social Justice and its personnel or its volunteers or any resources that has to offer. So this question is for you both. How can a civilian ensure awareness of what is going on related to civil rights, equity, and social justice in Reading? Are there things that you recommend? Um, I think education is a great place to start. Um, there is technical legal education that is, you know, at Sporte. Um, a lot of what we try to do in PAIR is the social education piece of it. Um, we are also trying to build those connections with community organizations and community partners, so and not just in terms of doing like, trainings, but also more sustained workshops. Over spring, we will be launching into a series of educational workshops with Bear. so you know, feel free to check out uh, my website, or we have a new newsletter now, so that will usually contain all the pertinent information, so if there is any specific theme that you know, uh, speaks out to you, feel free to drop in to that session. Um, but yeah, my answer would be educational learning. How about you? I would just echo that and say join pair. Uh, if you want to have your, your finger on the pulse of what's going on, um, diversity, equity, inclusion wise, and rhetoric and the program that's going on, I think pair is a really good place to start. Um, you know, we've had recent newer members that are a part of different organizations, and when they come to the meeting, they're like, oh, wow, this is probably the place I should be on Wednesday nights once a month. Um, it's been really great for me to see you know, a wonderful group of people coming together from diverse backgrounds, maybe they had different reasons for joining, maybe they had different you know, goals and things like that, but the cohesiveness through the last you know, several months to come together as a group and start pushing towards some really great programming, this, this being one of them, I think it's been, uh, it's been a really rewarding part of, of my position so far since January. Wonderful. The next question um, is interesting. It asks, will your roles um, as um, the director of Equity and social justice, or as a civil rights officer, limit a civilian's right to free speech? Um, the answer is no. Free speech is protected by the law in this land, as we all know. And that's not the intention either from a diversity, equity, and inclusion mission standpoint point of view. The idea here is to expand equal access to fundamental rights and constitutional rights, not to delete fundamental rights. At least not here in Reading, not the way we are doing things here at this moment. Um, that said, there is a very thin line between free speech and not so nice speech. It's not illegal to be rude or mean to our senior community, our kids, but it's not very nice. And so one of the things that we do at PAIR is invite people in, no name calling, no shaming, uh, but just kind of look at it as a self-education, self-learning opportunity to kind of learn from each other, listen to each other, and celebrate each other. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can say no loud enough without scaring anybody in the room, so uh, quite, quite um, seriously, my position is the exact opposite of that. It's protecting uh, people's rights to free speech. Um, you know, probably one of the least favorite jobs of a police officer is having to stand and protect somebody who is having some kind of demonstration and voicing their opinion of which the police officer couldn't disagree with more. But yet we stand there with our back to those people and protect them because of their right to free speech. 
And because regardless of whatever they're saying, whether we agree with it or not, we're police officers and we uphold the law, and one of those laws is protect people and their ability to voice their opinions, no matter how awful I may think they are from a personal standpoint, when I'm wearing my uniform, my job is to protect them and keep the peace and ensure that they have the ability to exercise that right. Um, you know, so with, with the conversation, when something like this is usually talked about in my office or with somebody around town, it usually kind of moves into, well, when does that become illegal when you turn around the other way and tell them to stop doing what they're doing or arrest those people or throw those people out. Um, and, and, you know, the really short answer is when there's a threat, essentially. Unless there's a real threat, a different crime that's already happened. Um, when, the, when the free speech becomes a threatening free speech, it's no longer free speech anymore. It's now not protected by our, by our, uh, by our Constitution. Um, so the Supreme Court has ruled, you know, very clearly that you know, illegal, you know, advocating for illegal conduct is, is protected speech. You can advocate for it, um, but intentional incitement of illegal conduct is illegal. So those would be what we would call fighting words. Um, I'm sure people have heard that term before. So the police officers are going to protect somebody, no matter how grotesque their opinion may be, until they reach that, reach and cross that threshold, in which case we'll turn and now handle those individuals and to the extent of the law that we can. But up until that point, no matter how hard it is for us to do, we're gonna protect that person's, that person or that group's right to free speech, regardless of which, uh, what our opinion happens to be on that particular matter. And that we would do that for anybody, both in a good way or a bad way, depending on your opinion of, of what they're there to talk about. So I think this is a good opportunity to think about some of the, the tough parts, some of the things that are challenges in your work. So if you could each share maybe challenges that you're grappling with. Sure. Um, I think one of the main challenges that I face with my job is around, you know, perception regarding my role. So the perception of a big position that conflicts with political democracy. Um, I'm a paid employee of the town, and regardless of how this position might have been created and came about in town, my role is not that of a political advocate. There are very um, strong boundaries around what I'm permitted to do as a government employee and what I'm not. Um, also, I'm an educator, facilitator, and a resource person. I'm not, I, I don't think a campaign manager kind of you know, skill set is something that uh, is befitting uh, for someone like me. That means I don't push policy change. If um, our elected officials, if they want to act on a policy and if they want my advice, I'm available as a resource but my office is not responsible or cannot push that policy change to go forward. The other thing that I grapple with a lot is um, what I call the change fever. So one of the questions that I get a lot of times since I've been here is, you know, what are, what are those changes that you're bringing about and how are you gonna you know, bring about redemption in this town? And I always take a step back with that question. Um, multiple reasons, I think, despite having like a heightened sense of excitement or insight around the role, I think it's really important to first contextualize the role a little bit and also think about change. Um, change is not a cookie, it's not something that we can, it's not an apple that we go pluck from a tree or buy from a store. Uh, it's a process and it's a collaborative process that requires change to kind of be spread out and integrated throughout uh, an organization and the same applies for us here in Reading. Also, DI work uh, means scientific change, like a scientific approach to change, so balancing out change and continuity, taking a stock of what's working and what's not working, and then bringing all that data and information back to kind of re-evaluate and redirect. Um, so one of the challenges that I think are particularly important to address in my role is kind of breaking down jargons, fancy words like social justice, to very actual, actionable items, and raising education and awareness. For you. Uh, so, I would say I, I'm extremely limited by Massachusetts general laws when I'm investigating what the regular person would call a quote unquote hate crime. Um, what's really important to note when, when facts of a matter are kind of relayed to me is a hate crime can't be a hate crime unless there's an underlying initial crime that happens first before we even talk about the bias or anything like that. So, what does that mean? There has to be some type of an assault or something more violent than that. There has to be a destruction of property. There has to be a threat. 
first. If we're missing that first element, we can't even talk about the bias that's included in it because we don't have a crime. Massachusetts doesn't technically have a hate crime law. We have to prosecute under the underlying offense, which is assault and battery or, or destruction of property, something like that, and then add an enhancement of a civil rights violation, which is a separate law that only kicks in if there's that underlying crime. There's, I can't just charge somebody with a civil rights violation. It has to be a part and parcel to another crime. So what that means is we have to get that first initial crime first, and then we have to be able to prove, which is easier said than done sometimes, that the offender had some type of bias or perceived bias um, that was motivated something by the, by the person's race, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. It has to fit into those categories. Massachusetts has very specific categories, and it has to fit in there. So one of the hardest things for me as a police officer is to have a very serious incident that's obviously greatly affecting somebody or an entire community, and to have to be the person to relay back to them, well, you don't check all the right boxes, so we can't charge them. What are we supposed to do then? What am I supposed to do then? Well, that's hopefully what I'm figuring out and what I have been trying to figure out since January. I'll probably figure it out many years from now. But it's going to be the community aspect of it. It's going to be that other prong of my job. Um, we work to prevent over here, but we're also looking to do the best we can at remedy, remedying issues that have come up, that have come up or will come up in town, that don't rise to we can bring you to court, but that's not to say that it doesn't greatly affect people in this community members of this community and, and far reaches outside of our community as well. So that's the kind of hardest part for me, is to look somebody in the eye that has been greatly affected by something and say, it's not a crime, but don't worry, we're gonna have a program about it and we're gonna, and we're gonna work on it. So I'm a police officer, I like to say, they did a bad thing, I'm gonna go put handcuffs on, I'll take him to court, you can see him on the news later. That's the easy one for me. Uh, learning this new kind of role of civil rights officers, figuring out, well, it doesn't meet this, a lot of stuff doesn't meet the, the criminal category. So what am I going to do with that 95% of stuff that goes on that greatly affects people um, and do something to help? So that's what I'm still working on. Love some suggestions and volunteers to help me on, help me on in that way as well. So that's what I And related to that, um, one thing that you also have been looking at is um, how the federal piece can sometimes support where the state law can't. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the federal government obviously has a longer reach than our state government does, and that's, that's typical of um, most federal government things. Uh, but they have a, a little bit stronger grip on things that would be involved in some type of a, like a civil issue where it would be like denying service to a certain group of people based on one of those categories that, that I mentioned earlier, um, a restaurant or, or a store that is constantly um, discriminating against a person based on one of those protected classes. While that may not actually rise to the level of a crime, I still want to know about it because I can push that in the right direction to the, uh, to the Attorney General's office and then up into the federal government as well, to the U.S. Attorney's office, and they have some uh, tools at their disposal to either file uh, civil type penalties or make it uh, so that a licensure or something like that can be revoked. They have a, a much stronger ability to handle things of a civil nature. So while I can't be the person that signs the complaint or, or issues the citation or anything like that, I can certainly be a, a catalyst and an avenue to get um, a, a member of our community to the right people who can't do that. So we are down to the last question. This has gone by really fast. It's been great to learn more about your backgrounds, your work, why you do what you do. And the last question asks you to reflect a little bit more on how other people have influenced you. So the question is, is there a person you consider a mentor and how have they influenced your life? I think I probably have the most obvious answer, which is my mom. And I have to think about this, the response to this question very carefully because I feel like I'm always dealing with complicated questions, systemic level questions, but never really thought very deeply about this particular thing. Um, as far as personalities go, my mom and I are very different people. Um, totally my daddy's girl. Um, but now, the older I grow, I begin to realize how much of who I am and what I do is very much influenced by her. Um, she's been a constant, encouraging, very courageous person who's always taken me on to pursue my dreams, even thousands of miles away from home. Uh, even when the going got tough in grad school, she was always there. Um, she always she instilled in both my sister and me values of hard work. So we were taught from a child 
right from when we were kids that nothing comes free, you've got to work for it, and the eels of hard work might be slow, but they're sure and uh, stable when they do come. And regarding everybody with respect um, and humility, approaching people with humility, no matter how you know, great and professional and educated you might be, treating people the same, irrespective of how different they might be from you. Um, a lot of the stuff and spirit that I try to bring into pair that we, um, as you know, members and partners in town, try to do through pair is exactly that approach, very difficult conversations, difficult decisions, uh, through the lens of humanity, uh, through the lens of patience and kindness, and I often reflect that, that so much of this uh, orientation is influenced by my mom. It's really beautiful. How about for you, Pat? I thought we were supposed to play rock, paper, scissors, so you got to go first on that one. So I chose my dad. So, uh, so my dad was a police officer in Reading for 33 years. He finished off his last four years as the, as the chief here in Reading. And so I know it's an easy one to pick. You pick your mom, you pick your dad, and you can say, oh, they, they raised me on these things. But it's, it, it's, a, it's a humbling experience to literally sit in the office that my father sat in a few decades ago and be doing the job he did a few decades ago. Um, and be doing a lot of the same work. They didn't call it being a civil rights officer, but my dad cared very much <clears throat> about treating everybody equally and treating everybody the same. That's how I was raised. Um, he taught also, he also was able to teach me that fine art of balancing being a father, being a police officer, being a supervisor, being the training officer, being a civil rights officer, being the day shift lieutenant, with being t-ball coach, softball coach, soccer coach, things like that. Um, and it's that kind of guidance that he gave me to be the best uh, Pat Silva I can be, regardless of what it's the, the lieutenant today, or the civil rights officer today, or the husband, or father, or coach today. So that's what he really instilled in me, and that's the, what I try to bring to being the civil rights officers, knowing that I play so many different roles. Most people only see me in a police uniform, but I play all these different roles. So when I look at somebody, who knows how many roles they play that I have no idea about. So I feel like if I can view everybody in that light, I'm going to end up treating everybody the same because today they might be a suspect of a crime, but tomorrow they might be the coach across the field that's coaching the softball. It just happened. So um, it, it happens. It's, you know what I mean? But it's, it's, it helps me be a really good, in my opinion, civil rights officer in the right person for the job. Well, that brings us to the end of our submitted questions. Um, next, we're going to have Crystal and Darren hand out some index cards to you. And we're going to ask you to do a short written reflection. The idea of this process is to take a minute to think about what we've learned from our presenters. And the two questions are on your handout. They are one thing that you've learned um, from tonight's event, and one question you might still have for these two folks. Um, Darren is one of our interns at the Reading Police Department. Crystal is our outreach coordinator for the Reading Coalition. Special thanks to them for helping us with tonight's event. You can subscribe to it and have you engage, have you have coffee conversations, come to care, attend the meetings. Join the party. I would echo the same thing. I can obviously be reached um, you know, in the traditional ways that police officer can, but I'm also, I work during the day, and I'm happy to, to meet up with somebody just um, at Nero again, uh, uh, or just to, just to answer any questions or whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be any formal in an office or an interview room or anything like that. It can just be um, at a coffee shop or something like that. I'm more than happy to do whatever you're comfortable with in order to answer any questions or, or guide you in the right direction if there's something you have to do. Um, I think I may be able to help. And, and so thank you everybody for coming out and appreciate that.